if I would just beam down to earth for this season, right? I'd never watched football before and I was forced to watch every game from this season. I would be expecting Arsenal to win the league. If Liverpool don't go on to win the league, those two Manchester United goals are going to be replayed a lot because mm -hmm. they were great goals, but they were also narrative heavy, I would say. To win 4-2, to score four goals in the game where you didn't play that well, they've got so many match winners and I think that, that may be a, a deciding factor. The one I'm looking at at the moment is Bukayo Saka. Feels like he's been on the edge of an injury <laughs> that could rule him out for a couple of games and that would be massive for Arsenal. He is. He's their Salah. Hello there, welcome to High Press, brought to you by William Hill in partnership with the Football Writers Association. I'm Vishali Bardwaj, and this is a show where we bring you the finest writers from Fleet Street to discuss the biggest topics in football. I'm pleased to say that today I'm joined by a stellar lineup Liam Toomey from The Athletic, Dom Smith from The Standard, and Dean Jones from Sports Lens. Welcome, guys. Now, in this show, we're going to be uh, looking back at some of the most iconic title races and discussing whether or not this season's one is indeed the greatest one that you guys have ever seen. So let's start off with what happened this weekend, really. Arsenal winning, Man City winning uh, as well, but Liverpool dropping points. I mean, how did you all see this weekend's results? Well, I watched the Liverpool-Manchester United game from the press room up at Bramall Lane, uh, head of Sheffield United-Chelsea, which didn't quite have the same stakes, I hmm. have to say. And it felt to me in the moment, I don't know how you guys feel, that if Liverpool don't go on to win the league, those two Manchester United goals are going to be replayed a lot because mm. they were great goals, but they were also narrative heavy, I would say. The Bruno Fernandes won shades of a kind of Gerard Slip thing, although that's very unfair on Gerald Quansar. Um, hopefully for him, it doesn't turn out to be that significant. Yeah. And then, of course, the the young phenom emerging, Kobe Minu. There's no containing the hype now after a goal like that. So that... That was what stuck with me. I, f I feel like that will be prominent in any montages of Liverpool not getting it done in Klopp's final season. Yeah. A lot of this season, I think, is going to come down to emotion. And I think that that's what we saw at the weekend. Like, Liverpool were involved in an emotional battle at Old Trafford. And it kind of got the better of them. Like, their finishing was off. They weren't clinical. And then you watch the other two games. You watch Man City, you know put Palace to bed. You watch Arsenal, you think, actually, there's some pressure here for Arsenal. It's a tough game going to Brighton. And they win it so easily, really. <laughs> there's no emotion involved in that game. And I just feel like when you're assessing the running from here, how are they really going to cope in those moments that Liverpool have just had to cope with two? And look, Liverpool didn't lose the game, ultimately. They'll see it as points dropped because Man United aren't the Man United that they once were. But I, yeah, I come away from the weekend just thinking, like, how are these teams actually going to cope with the pressure not just of the occasion, but the atmosphere that they're in. You're right to say there that there was no emotion in the Arsenal win and the, and the Man City win. And I think that's important, you know, ruthless win after win after win, you know, getting it done without, you know, any drama. But I do think if, if either of those two had been playing Manchester United this weekend, it may well have been a little bit different. I think we've got to give Liverpool that, you know, you know, a mention at least for that. You know, they were playing their biggest rivals and you can slip up in a game of that magnitude. I, I was at Selhurst Park for the Manchester City game and I wasn't actually that impressed by them, particularly in the first half when, you know, Palace were getting in behind with, with players like Mateta constantly. But to win 4-2, to score four goals in the game where you didn't play that well, they've got so many match winners and I think that that may be a, a deciding factor. Of course, Kevin De Bruyne reached his 100th City goal in that game. Dean, I'm going to come back to you because you mentioned emotion potentially playing a part in this season's title race. I mean, looking at Liverpool, there's a lot of emotions uh, around Anfield this season because everyone knows that Jurgen Klopp is leaving and a lot of people have said that that could actually fire them to the title but do you think also it could actually hinder the team because there is so much pressure on the players? I mean, what factors do you think could play a key role in this season's title race? Yeah, I mean, there's that hope factor that does all end brilliantly but there's also the fear factor that it could all end disastrously which is how it would now be viewed. Like, whichever two teams don't win this title are going to see it as a, a big missed opportunity because next season, who knows what, what comes again. You talk about emotion of the players, but it's the managers as, as well and the intensity of those managers and how they deal with these occasions. So you look at what they've been through at the weekend and look, Jurgen Klopp, we, we know he's got this 
sense of sarcasm almost when he has this smile. Any decision that goes against Liverpool, you see that smile appear on his face. You know he's really annoyed, but he's not going to show it in that way. He'll show it in some other way. And you look at the two other managers, and Arteta, I feel like, could boil over at any minute, right? He's so intense, like he's, his brain's going a million miles an hour. Could that harm his players? Maybe, maybe. I, I, do, want, I do worry about Arsenal in, in that sense. Like, how will they manage these key pressurised moments? Because we haven't seen it before. Only last season when they were half in a title race, they didn't manage to get over the line. And then Pep, yeah, like he looks frazzled. Like he's, he's like gripping his brain. Like he, he's got no more space in there, but he's like shaking it, trying to find some more solutions. But he's been there and done it. So... You're always going to give the benefit of the doubt to Pep Guardiola. Mm, I mean, Liam, how, how important do you think experience will be of winning Premier League titles recently in this title race? Because, of course, it was mentioned really last season, the results that Arsenal got at the ending of the season, losing to Brighton and then Nottingham Forest. The season before when they were going for the top four, they, they lost to Spurs and then they lost to Newcastle away, wasn't it? How much do you think this side have sort of developed under Mikel Arteta? And even though they are a young side and they haven't won the title recently, this side in particular, how do you see that playing a part? You know, the experience of City and Liverpool in these sorts of title races. In a vacuum, Arsenal look ready to me. I think they've got all the ingredients. I think the addition of someone like Declan Rice and the force of personality that he's added, as well as his quality in midfield, has made a massive difference for them. For me, I think there's always a tension in these title races between the experience, the pedigree of having been there and done it, which City clearly have in abundance, but Liverpool also have with their leaders and the hunger, which I think will be greatest with Arsenal. I think the Arteta um, intensity that you mentioned there, Dean, I think they know what an opportunity this is. And having pushed City for a while last year and then ultimately fallen away, I think they feel like it's their time. The thing that I find interesting, like if I was looking, if I would just beam down to earth for this season, I'd never watched football before and I was forced to watch every game from this season, I would be expecting Arsenal to win the league. I would be watching every game thinking, this is the best team in this league. Mm. They've, they've been asked questions, they've dug deep at times, and they've had, think of the first half of this season, there was a lot of like narrow, narrow wins, right? There was a lot of one goal margins. And so you start to doubt them over that. And then they start battering everyone, right? They're emptying stadiums everywhere they go. And you're like, okay, this team's the real deal. But because we weren't beamed down to earth just for this season, we assess <laughs> them on more than that. And we know what Man City are capable of. We know what Liverpool are capable of. And we know that Arsenal might just have these little messages at the back of their brain, like, are you sure we're good enough for this? Are you sure we're good enough? I think Declan Rice does change the picture. He's come in there as a £100 million plus footballer to progress a very key element of that team and to take them to the next step to actually challenge properly for a league title. And I think he's done it. And I think that the pressure on him individually and to actually change that team has been incredible the way he stepped up to that. So yeah, I think that Arsenal deserve to win the league. William Saliba, last season he was out injured for a long time and a lot of Arsenal fans were like, this is why we weren't able to keep clean sheets and kind of get it over the line last season. He has been a bedrock in at the heart of Arsenal's defence this season. How much do you think this title race could come down to keeping your squad, your players fit in what is the final couple of games? Massive, A massive part of it will come down to the availability of your key players in, in this run-in. You obviously look at Liverpool's squad throughout the last few months and they've been decimated at times. Um, Man City have missed key players, but they've got the best squad in the league, so they've been able to cope with it. And Arsenal have actually been quite fortunate so far in, in terms of being able to avoid big injuries to key players. Now, we can't predict who might suffer problems, but someone will. Like in these last eight games of the season, they are probably going to at some point miss a Gabriel, a Saliba, a Declan Rice. And if that guy is missing for even one, two games, like when City have missed Rodri for one or two games, mm -hmm. the knock-on effect of that can be huge. So it'll be interesting from Arsenal's perspective, if one of those key players goes, can they cope with it? You mentioned there that Arsenal haven't had too many serious injuries this season and they have been fortunate. And I think we should mention that. But I actually think we should also therefore mention and give some credit to City and Liverpool for some of the injuries that they've had. They had and absences that were not because of injury, like, for example, Mohamed Salah, who was sort of injured and sort of at AFCON, you know, for, for, for a long period of time, which is a, a big miss. He's, you know, he's their best player. 
and um, they had Sabozlai injured for a long time. Manchester City lacked De Bruyne for months. I think he got injured on the first game of the season, didn't he, at, at Turf Moor against Burnley and Erling Haaland as well. And the way that those two teams have been able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Arsenal, who, given those injuries, have probably had the best squad in the Premier League over the course of the season, given the importance of players like De Bruyne, Salah, Haaland. I think Manchester City and Liverpool actually deserve a lot of credit for how they've they've stayed there despite those serious injuries. The one I'm looking at at the moment is Bukayo Saka. Feels like he's been on the edge of an injury <laughs> that could rule him out for a couple of games for about six weeks. And that would be massive for Arsenal. He is, he's their Salah. You know, he's their difference maker in the final third. So if he can stay fit, I think allied to that defensive identity they've got, they might have enough to get over the line. But if he goes down for a, a significant period, it could look very different for them. Yeah, and of course, you've got Europe to throw into the mix, haven't you? Because, of course, City and Arsenal are in Champions League action and Liverpool are in the Europa League. So let's see, obviously, what happens with the remains of this title race. But let's now move on to the most iconic title races of all time. I mean, 2012, when Man City won it on the final day with Sergio Aguero scoring mm. that that dramatic winner in added time against QPR. Let's start off with that one because I think, um, you know, for me personally, that was one of the most iconic ones. I think it was just the fact that City beat their City rivals, Manchester United, to the title. So that you've got that in the mix. You've got, you know, Man United at Sunderland, I think they were. Mm. Um, thinking they'd won it, that goal from Aguero coming in added time, dramatic fashion. There'd been a red card in that game as well. I mean, what do you remember from that day and that season as a whole? I remember listening to it on Radio 5 Live and just I was just sat in the garden and just thinking, I can't believe that a 38-game season would come down to this. It was just extraordinary. And yeah, not only the last game of the season, but the last minutes of the season. Yeah. You actually couldn't write it. If you wanted to write the end of a Premier League season, you would write it like that. And you've got Manchester United, as you mentioned, walking around, Wayne Rooney walking around, thinking that they, they may have won the title again. And they hadn't because of extraordinary circumstances with Manchester City. Um, and also that was their first league title as well. And to win it in that fashion is just genuinely extraordinary and so dramatic. And I think the Premier League and, and the, the broadcasters of the Premier League dined out on that for five, six, seven years because it was such an extraordinary moment. It was an incredible moment and it sells the Premier League so well because at that point, the Premier League was really starting to assert itself over La Liga, Serie A, these other leagues. And not only could it then sell that it's got the best players, it could also sell it's got the best drama. It was an incredible... I don't actually think that the title race was the best title race. They were certainly close, but I don't think the quality of football um, was as interesting or the the drama between the managers. And we love to personalise title races, I think, you know, through the managers. We've mentioned Arteta and Klopp and... and uh, Guardiola for, for that reason you know that they're, they're such interesting engaging people I'm not sure we had that in that title race but the way it ended incredible I honestly didn't think we would see a moment like that ever again I think in the, even in the commentary it said you, you'll never see scenes like this again <laughs> and you get to this season you're like maybe we will maybe we will like it, I don't think it's impossible that don't quite see that same drama on the final day of the season but now that we are in a situation whereby we might get a title race that goes right down to the wire I think that that day comes more into vision again and you start to look back on how that game opened up, how that moment came about. United fans will still say, QPR could have kept that ball down the other. QPR could have done something there. There was no need for that ball to break in the way that it did. <laughs> and I'm sure that they're still reeling from it. But for City, they'll be replaying it again, being like, it might come down to this. And remember, if it does come down to it, you are the ones that will win this title. Another really good title race for me was 2009-10 between Chelsea and Manchester United. And Chelsea, I mean, that season statistically has faded a little bit with what Liverpool and Manchester City have done in the last couple of years. But 103 goals that year and they win the league by a point. And they had to go to Old Trafford a few weeks before the end of the season and win in order to actually get that point. Um, so I think... I, I, th I think Scoring that many goals or conceding so few goals should be rewarded in that way. I think we, we should also mention 2015-16 as well, which wasn't as high quality a title race, but for it to have been Leicester City versus Tottenham, which no one predicted at the beginning of the season. <laughs> well, is... there were 5,000 to 1 outsiders, weren't they? They were, yes. And I remember league. seeing some stories that some people had put 20p on it and uh, 
you know, bought themselves a new house. <laughs> it's 20p excellently spent in yeah. hindsight, isn't it? But um, yeah, I mean, I remember Claudio Ranieri obviously came in as their new manager, Leicester, and they won on the first game of the season against Sunderland 4-2. And I remember thinking that's quite an impressive result. They've survived relegation the previous year. Jamie Vardy had scored quite a few goals in the final couple of months of the season. He'd got himself an England debut on the back of that. But they weren't a particularly excellent team at the end of that season. They just survived relegation by doing, by getting a few decent results. And, and in came Ranieri. And they just kept winning week after week after week. And the quality of the football that they were playing, obviously, was not as good as the quality of football that Tottenham were playing. That was the Deli Alley season where he scored 20 goals. was just absolutely incredible all season. I remember he scored um, two fantastic goals against Chelsea, didn't need to beat, to beat them in that season. But also, and I know we're talking about title races, that season also had really good su subplots beyond that. That was the Dimitri Payet season where he was just scoring for fun for West Ham, that free kick against Crystal Palace. And also that was Marcus Rashford's season as well when he got the chance against Michelin in the Europa League and came through and he got himself onto the plane for the Euros for England. So a really good season in general, maybe not the high quality title race that, compared to some of them that we talking about but less of City versus Tottenham who, who saw that coming certainly not me the demerit for me about that title race has always been that Leicester always played first and they always won so Spurs were always a few points behind they were always playing catch up they weren't really the momentum swings the the drama came from wow they're actually going to do this you know week by week it became clearer and clearer that they didn't really feel the pressure they felt like they were playing with house money essentially and it was Spurs who felt the pressure of overcoming this long history of being the and you know, third. glamorous yeah. underachievers. Yeah, and ended up finishing third Incredible. in a two-horse race as, yeah. as the banter goes. Um, so I, I think ultimately that's probably the, the greatest story of the Premier League era, but maybe not the greatest title race. Pep Guardiola versus Jurgen Klopp. That's been quite a rivalry in recent years, has it? We, we haven't seen the Arsenal Wenger pushing Jose Mourinho moment or anything <laughs> like that, but their teams have really gone toe to toe and they've just taken the level to another level, really, in the Premier League in terms of what you need to win the title. Yeah, I think it's probably been the purest sporting rivalry that we could have imagined, both on a a coaching level and between the two teams. How many sort of mass brawls have you seen in those games? Really, They've been some of the highest quality big game clashes I think we've seen in the league and some of the most tactically interesting as well. No two of them are the same, really. Um, they're all chess matches in and of themselves. But Klopp versus Pep has never quite taken off in that sense. I think they've got too much respect for each other and how good they are. I think they both recognise they're the two preeminent coaches of their generation and they both represent a, a certain style of football that's bigger than just themselves it's very new age isn't it it's, it's a new age rivalry like these, these sort of rivalry didn't used to exist you know you wouldn't you wouldn't have got ferguson acting like this with a guy he's going toe to toe with season after season after season because it it wasn't the way things were done and you wanted to get aggressive and angry and wind people up and the world's changed in the last few years, like generally, and that, that has been reflected in football and certainly in football management. But I think it had to be because you can't manage players the same way as Ferguson once did. You probably can't even really manage teams the way that Mourinho did. And that wasn't even that long ago. Mourinho's found that, <laughs> among <laughs> others. Exactly. I think as well, like you think back to Ferguson and Wenger, like Ferguson was the king of the league. And Wenger arrived and Ferguson barely knew who he was. And Wenger came in with a self-confidence and very quickly started to make his mark and shake things up a bit. Ferguson didn't like that at all. And you know, I think he struggled to respect him for a while, but even once he did respect him, he couldn't handle it. And he was he was rattled by it week in, week out. And they they really wound each other up. And, you know, through the years I've done plenty of us and Wenger press conferences and you know, once he gets rattled, he, he's really like, it's it's bubbling underneath there and he's trying to control it and he can't, especially if it was about um, Alex Ferguson. In terms of that coming back, I think it's very difficult, especially when you talk about Man United. Like, okay, Ten Hag's there now and occasionally you see flashes of it, but even if you hear about if Ten Hag doesn't keep his job, who comes to replace him? Gareth Southgate's talked about, Graham Potter's talked about. You're not talking about a guy here that's going to come in and start confronting everybody like Ferguson used to or like Mourinho did when he came in calling himself the special one. Like that type of personality doesn't seem to exist right now um, when it comes to making big appointments. 
Okay, so let's go to what happens on the final day of the season. Do you guys believe, with it being so tight, one point separating the top three, seven games left, tricky fixtures coming up, Tottenham have to play all three, don't they? Do you guys think this is going to go down to the final day? I do think we'll see a title that's won on the final day. Even if you have somebody that's in front of that point. Like Personally, I think Man City, it still feels like it's their title to lose. Like It is because they've had their hands on it for the last few years. But in the sense of like where they are in the league table now, it doesn't look like they're in control. Yet somehow I feel like they are in control <laughs> and this is still theirs. Dom? I would agree that it will probably come down to the last day of the season and I also think it will be two rather than three one will have dropped off but I don't think that the two who could win it on the last day of the season will be level on points necessarily I think maybe it might be a, a one needing a win and another just needing a draw or um or well, there's one point between them I, I think we will see some separation I, I don't see seven games you know every you know all three teams w winning all seven games I think that would be pretty unlikely do you think there'll be like a shock result somewhere along the way I, I think there'll be at least one to be yeah. honest and I hope so you know just for the drama yeah how about you Liam I'd love it to be all three on the final day and they're uh, all at home as well on the final day of the season yeah it, it would be amazing if if they were all still in it but I, I I do think it will probably be two I think that's the best we can realistically hope for with Manchester City because as you said they've got the best squad in the league because they've got the best coach in the world they always feel like they've got the widest margin of error of any team that they can rotate more they can you know make mistakes in games and still win um but I, I, I just feel like they're not quite as controlled and on it. I mean, it's hard to be more of those things than they were last year when they won everything. Um, but they, they don't have the same sense of relentlessness. Haaland doesn't have the same sense of relentlessness individually compared to what he was doing last year. And that's what makes me lean slightly towards Arsenal, I think, just based on what I'm seeing. But obviously, there's the big unknown of when they see the finish line near... Can Arsenal go that final step and, and get over it? We know the other two can and they probably won't blink because of the characters involved. Arsenal are the biggest question mark in that respect, but I do think they've got everything else. Okay, so one final question to round up today's episode. Are we witnessing the greatest ever title race in Premier League history? I think we are, actually. I think we are. This it's, is the best title race we've ever seen because I've never seen three teams at this stage so close to the finish line genuinely believing they're going to win it and all thinking they should win it. And it's going to be so traumatising for those two teams that don't get their hands on the trophy, especially if it's Man City that actually still win the title this season. Like, what's that going to say to everybody else? If a season that they, were, they weren't at their best, that other teams have dominated the league for long periods, if Man City still come on top, it's totally demoralising for everybody. Yeah. Sadly, it's probably the most likely outcome. Dom? I think it is the most interesting and the best title race we've seen because, as Dean says, it's three. Will it prove to have been the best? Um, we'll have to see, won't we? Um, but at the moment, with them as close as they are, yes, it is. I think, Stan, you're saying yes. And Liam, finally? To this point, yes. But the, there's a big caveat in that I think when we're looking back on the greatest title races, the Premier League era, we look back on the last seven or eight games, which we haven't had yet. Mm -hmm. There will be twists, there will be turns and how much they shift the momentum, how much drama is involved, how many unpredictable narratives are thrown up, I think will make all the difference in terms of potentially lifting this one above some of the others we've talked about. Well, it's been absolutely fantastic watching what's happened so far in the Premier League. I'm sure the final seven games are going to bring a lot more drama. Guys, thanks so much for your thoughts and opinions on, on the most iconic title races and, of course, this season's title race as well. Now, if you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you hit subscribe for more weekly content. This is High Press brought to you by William Hill in partnership with the Football Writers Association. 18 plus, please gamble responsibly. <laughs>